it's like part of the English way of life. It's like the teddy bear's picnic. It's like the BBC. It's like cornflakes. But there it was, and I used to play it so often, and I was very, very influenced by it. I'm trying to remember when I first heard the record. It was probably when I was about nine or ten, and singing as a boy treble myself. Not a particularly good one, but good enough, I think, for my school music master to say, listen to this. This is how a boy's voice should sound. This, in fact, is how a boy should sing. We would literally sit round the fire at home with the governor's gramophone, and he would play for us some of those magical 78 records, which were his pride and joy. And the song that I always remember, the piece that I always remember, it was being played, of course, all the time on the radio as well. And it was very important because being a singer, a boy soprano, I, do, I suppose I must have modelled myself rather on him too. Whenever I hear choristers' voices, I, I always hear Ernest Luff's disembodied voice somewhere. presenting to him the honorary diploma of fellow of the Royal School of Church Music. Ernest Love received his fellowship award for a lifetime of music making, but for most people he is remembered for just one record. For them, he is still Master Ernest Love, the boy who sang Over the Wings of a Dove. Until a few years ago in the choir of the Temple Church and still in the Bach choir. Ernest Luff is my father. When I was a boy, I sang with him in the same church where he made his famous recordings 30 years earlier. And even then, I was daunted by his reputation as the greatest chorister of them all. Today, I still meet people who say, I remember Over the Wings of a Dove. We used to play it when we were children. And it continues to amaze me that a gramophone record made in 1927, when recording techniques were very much in their infancy, should continue to remain as popular as it has. I wanted to find out why that record is still with us, and why a venture that started out as a very modest and unambitious recording of a London church choir should have become one of the most successful records of all time. The story of Ernest Luff's musical life began in 1923, when he came to London in search of a place in a cathedral choir. Even then, London was a city of traffic jams, but in those days the men wore hats. Amazingly, given what was to follow, he was turned down at his first audition at Southwark Cathedral, and it was only when he came here, to the Temple Church in Fleet Street, that he was offered a place as a chorister. The Temple Choir of the 1920s was already renowned for producing a succession of fine boy sopranos under the guidance of its young choirmaster, George Fulman Ball, known affectionately as Doctor to generations of choir boys. It was a tradition he had only recently inherited from Sir Henry Walford Davis. Ernest Luff, already 12 years old, was starting comparatively late for a boy soprano. Now in his 80s, my father returned to the Temple Church recently with the writer and broadcaster Jeremy Nicholas, who has made a study of the Temple Choir and those early recordings. The Temple Church, like the Temple Choir, is administered and paid for by the barristers and judges of the Inns of Court at the Inner and Middle Temple, and it was the musical interest of one particular judge, Lord Justice Banks, that led to that first recording. We used to sing Hear My Prayer. It was in the normal services. Only about once a year, but we did it. And it was that point that Lord Justice Banks said to Dr. Pity we can't hear that more often. The doctor said, you can, if you make a record of it. Simple as that. Fulban Ball was aware of the recent advances in recorded sound, and his desire to put his own choir on record coincided with HMV's introduction of their first mobile recording van. The choir had three soloists at the time, Doug Horton, Ron Mallett, and Ernest Luff, and it was my father whose voice was judged to be in the best condition on the day of the recording. Now, where did you actually 
make the record here, presumably. Well, here, yes. where, where do they put the microphone? Well, there's one microphone here. Yeah. Which took the organ. We were all on this side, on the cantori side, two rows of boys. I was there at the back, and the gentlemen were behind in these rake pews. And um, the head boy, who was Ron Mallet, <coughs> was at the end there, and he was more or less the chap in charge. We took all our nods and starts from him. No oh, conductor. No conductor? No conductor at all, no. So, doctor on the organ, Ron Mallet in charge of the choir, more or less, stopping, starting everything for him. And the man stood here, and uh, as the red light came on, he used to raise his hand. And when the wax was beginning to turn, he'd lower his hand, Ron would start us. And Ron would finish us. It's all done by him. Up here. so small that I had to stand on a couple of Bibles behind there to be up above because these lights weren't there then, they were tall lights. So I was raised up a bit, a bit higher, but that was all. The trouble was this year, when you did a wax recording, doctor used to say, that's a good one, we'll keep that. And when you meant to keep it, you never hear it again. So the black tape, you can play it back and say, yes, I could do it this or that better, with wax discs. Once it started and once it stopped, that was that. You never heard it again, not until it came out published. Pretty nerve-wracking. <clears throat> I thought it was, yes. Fourteen, fourteen and a half. Fourteen and a half. Quite old for a treble one, I think, oh, yeah. these days. Yes. We were more mature, shall we say. Um, we could understand better what we were doing the older we get. But we had to do it again, you know. We did it three times. The first time they brought their machine up here and we did the recording, the machine broke down. And then we did the, another one um, about three weeks later, which was the official one. Mm. And then, because the wax was worn out at the time they made so many presents, we had to do it again in the November. So, in that time, between March and November, my voice had changed a wee bit. I, I know it did. It got to be pretty, really, it got fruity, more fruity. So I know the difference between those two, but I don't think many people would know the difference. What I'm really impressed with, with Ernest, is the fact that he sings in the most perfect bel canto manner.